Fans of the Horus Heresy, thank you very much for joining me for a video where I'm going to talk about modelling tools. During the time I've been doing this channel, um, I've had a few questions from you guys about what tools I use um, for various things and some discussion with you. Some suggestions from some of you as well. And in a recent video, a commenter, Paul Lissamore, asked if I could do a video talking about the tools I use for working on my models. I'm going to have a go at that. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about a selection of tools I use for working on primarily resin models, you know, the Horus Heresy stuff by Forgeworld. However, any resin model I would work on, I would use these tools. And then amongst these tools are also the tools that I use to work on plastic kits as well. Kind of like this is actually really a summary of my general miniature modeling tools. How am I going to do this? So I'm going to talk about this in categories in terms of what the function of the tools are. And I'm going to point, talk about this from a point describing the functional type of tool and I'm not really going to talk about the brands although I'm going to feel a, feel a number of uh, things that are recognizably branded or made by certain manufacturers. I'm going to really approach this from a point of view of talking about a function that I had that I need to fulfill and then the type of tool I use to do that and then I will show a particular tool that I've got to fulfill that function. One of the things to bear in mind with this any topic about tools is there is an enormous market out there and there's also a lot of individual preferences and there are different types of tools for one particular role so I'm just showing here a selection that I've bought over years and they're the tools that I'm comfortable with using however there are in quite a, in lots of cases there are different types of tool available and you know, I would encourage you to experiment with different types and find the type that works best for you as opposed to necessarily taking the example I show you as being the best because it, it might not be the best for you because there are differences. Right, so what about the structure then? So I, I said I'm going to talk about this in categories. I'm going to go through the following categories and in each category I'm going to show you a selection of tools. And this is almost like in the sequence that you might build a model. So the first category is sawing. So this is exactly as it sounds. To, and tools I use to saw, saw parts, so typically sawing resin keys off models. The next category is clipping. So this is cutters and the like tools for snipping parts off screws. And it also covers wire as well. So I will deal with wire that I use as well for pinning. Cutting, so this is knives, exactly as it sounds. Sanding, so abrasives and other coarse tools to sand down features, removing seam, mold seams, mold slips and mold lines on plastic models. Drilling, so if you are, so this is going to look at pinning, touch a little bit on magnetization as well, some specialized drills I use for particular types of magnets. And I'm going to talk about adhesives, so this is just a selection of adhesive types that I use and other supporting gear. And finally I'm going to deal with just like a miscellaneous category and this is going to be kind of like all the things that don't fit into other categories but I regularly use for a particular purpose. So that's the plan. Right so let's go right back up to the top of that list and start with sawing. So if you're working on resin models chances are or it's an almost certainty that certainly with forge world anyway you're going to get the resin part on a casting key and you'll need to saw that quite often these are quite chunky big blocks and you'll need to saw that away so what do i mean by a key so i've uh, i've just raided my kit stash and i found a nice example so let me show you so this is the main hand assembly from the arioc power claw or power fist for the warlord battle titan uh, so yeah this is a this is a big component and here is the casting key or gate well, these are the gates, well, these are the gates, and then this is a key what's left over, or there's a few names for this bit. But it's a big lump of resin, and it needs to be removed from a part to assemble it. And sometimes, I mean, when you get these big, thick gates, it's quite often best to saw them as opposed to cutting them with snippers. And there's a couple of reasons for that. With sawing them, you're not putting the part under any stress. If you use clippers, then you impart a stress on the part either side, on the resin either side. And um, for me, and you kind of, unless you've got really sharp, large clippers, uh, or certainly when you go back past small clipping, you kind of, for me, you're losing a bit of control when you cut. If you use a saw, 
you can kind of like maybe cut a millimeter or so to one side take the key away nice and safely not putting any force on the main on the final part and then you can take a knife and clean that up so this is the sort of thing that I'm looking to remove when I'm talking about sawing so how do I do that so I use a razor saw this is the example that I have um, and basically it's a it's a very thin saw as you can see well you might not be able to see I've got it you can kind of see that and it's got some very fine teeth on it this make who makes this I can't remember the name of this uh, it's an American company yeah, made in the USA yeah it's a really handy tool and it might not look like much but I found this to be a really good design you know comfortable to use and, and easy and even better it's got this choke on it Let's loosen that and the blade comes out and it allows you to mount other blades and I've just got two that I use and this serves me fine for the sort of work I do uh, I've got a deeper blade as well so if I'm cutting large parts or maybe cutting across a complex set of gates uh, that works fine for me you can see how that's deeper that's a razor saw there's lots of those available if you're going to buy one I would definitely recommend you buy one it has a choke on it like this that allows you to change blades and the reason is firstly you might want different blades secondly you may find after a repeated use that you want to replace a blade also if you do a silly thing like I did once and use a blade on a material you're not familiar with this blade here um, I actually cut some carbon fiber rod when I was building my wall or Titan with this and as you can see I written on it blunt because the carbon fiber was so hard it took the edge off the teeth and it's it's no longer anywhere near as effective as it once was at cutting resin so I've kept this because if ever you know if I ever need to do any work like that again I've got a blade I don't mind putting on really hard materials but that's another advantage of having a removable blade if something goes wrong you can replace that blade so yeah so that's sawing I mean yeah there's, there's a few designs of razor saw available but I'd recommend one with a replaceable blade and also a range of alternative blades as well giving you a more flexible tool as well the next part of the tools topic is clipping I guess there's a couple of parts to this once you've sawed a, a part off you might have some post to remove or maybe it's a thinner part as well and if we go back to our Arioc power claw we've got this thin little gate here and rather than saw it that's probably just as well clipped I've got a couple of tools that I have for clipping for really heavy duty clipping I've got this set of wire cutters and these are like suit these are suitable for cutting quite hard wire they've got a hardened head so these teeth won't damage and I've I've these are probably I don't know 50 60 years old and they've been used a lot and you can see that the the teeth on these is in excellent condition these are made by a British company called Malm they cost about 35 quid a pair of those I'm sure there's cheap ones available but that's the sort of thing I would use I use for heavy duty cutting for more precise materials cutting I've got a pair of fine cutters and these are by who's this by Mr Tools I think these are manufactured in the Republic of China Taiwan if I remember rightly you can see that it's got a very fine cutter there's lots of these available you can pay uh, you can actually pay a lot of money for these things particularly when you get into the high-end types that are designed for Gundam or gun gun plaquettes where it's quite specialization I mean this isn't isn't cheap I think it's about 17 quid or something so they weren't cheap but they do work really well for cutting and just let me give you a quick demo so here we have a uh, there we go a piece of resin piece of uh, a resin gate and I bought these for actually for plastic cutting for doing gun plaquettes but I've actually found they're really good on resin as well and is that pinged off somewhere but yeah they cut really well particularly on thinner materials they're, they're really actually rather I just cut a little bit they're actually really gentle and sharp and nice to use so a pair of uh, equivalent model cutters like that I, I like these because they're a small tool so they're, they're they're easy to fit simple you know nothing complex about it a nice comfortable ergonomic grip a nice narrow head so they're easy to get into tight confines of sprues you know and, and into places like this easily so yeah so 
a pair of fine fine cutters as well. And I guess the other thing that you you might want, sort of in the kind of pliers and cutting department, is a set. Well, it is a set of pliers. Um, and these are rare. I've got. I keep these in my toolkit if I need to bend any wire. Because I, when I do pinning, I use stiff, springy steel wire. Is you know you're likely to push it, put it through your finger if you try to put bend some of the pins I do. So I got a set of fairly you know decent set of chunky pliers to do that with. Right, cutting. The next tool I'm going to show you is the tool I use more than any other tool. I guess it's our old favourite friend, the craft knife. Now these, you know, uh, and this is a this is a one that I use with a sharp blade and I use for most of the cutting that I do. There's dozens and dozens of designs of these things available. Uh, you can get ones with retracting blades, you can get ones with blades that advance, you can clip off at the end. This design, this is, who's this? This is a Swan Morton knife, it has replaceable blades, so I bought this because I'd been using disposable knives of the same design for a long time, but I eventually decided, well, you know, why just keep throwing the whole knife away? Just get the this and uh, and just replace a blade when it fails. So yeah, and you can get lots of blades. So again, by buying this, you know, it's a slightly higher cost up front, but over time it pays for itself. You get a more versatile tool as well. Now, I don't actually ever need to use alternate blades. I just stick with this design here, which is a, a 25A blade, and I go through lots of those and you get replacements in sealed packets like this, just non circular blades. Extremely sharp, so you have to be very careful with them. Very, very careful indeed, particularly when they're new. I know I've had a, I've had a good few cuts over the years. It's part, part and parcel of uh, doing this sort of stuff. I, I guess this has got a fairly heavy blade as well, although it has a nice feel to it as well, because when you're using it for a while, having the metal handle, it warms up in it. It feels very pleasant in the hand. So yeah, a sharp knife, and that's, you know, and um, obviously a plastic safety cover as well to protect it yourself against it when it's not in use. Talking of knives, right, so what did I do with my old plastic knives? Well, or disposable knives? Well, this is exactly the same company, I believe. Yeah, Swan Morton. Same blade, it's a 25A, but this time it's mounted in a disposable knife. I've kept a few of these, which I used to go through a lot of. I think I've still got a pack of new unused ones. But this is a knife that has got blunt over time. It's actually really quite blunt now. What I use this for is I use this for smoothing. I use this for a few things. I use it for smoothing off resin that I'm sanding down. I also use it for smoothing away mold lines on plastic miniatures I work on. And I guess that's the same sort of concept to Games Workshop sell a mold a mold line removal tool and it's using exactly the same principle of having an edge but without it being razor sharp and that just allows you to scrape it or take it over the plastic and remove a mold line without scratching the surface which a like a sharp blade will tend to do i've i use this a lot and if you watch my videos you'll see me use it from my how-to videos you'll see that used from time to time well how can you get something like this well i guess you can buy a specific tool like the gw one or if you've got some disposable knives, just work with one over time and, and wear it down. The thing you've got to be careful of if you're going to take the wear, wear one down approach is you've got to look after the blade. Um, you'll see that this one's still got the original point on it. You know, you've got to be careful not to knock the point off because you then leave yourself with a sharp, uh, a sharp edge which will defeat the object of what you're trying to do with having something that's smooth. That is cutting. Now there's another tool to show you on cutting, which is the newest tool that I've bought, or the newest tools that I've bought. And these are called micro chisels, and this was from a, a recommendation from one of you guys. And I'll show you the packet. So this is just a packet. So this is by Master Tools. Trumpeter is the brand name. That's, that's the packaging, but here's the actual chisel. So I've got two of these. Right, okay, I've got the focus. So. They're actually rather smart looking things. The business end is here. And what you've got is you've got a very sharply cut uh, chisel end. And you can see that it's designed for, you can scrape pulling it or you could push. And it's great for removing mold slips and mold seams in locations that are difficult to get to with craft knives. We grab our Arioc power claw again. Now, if you could imagine in, see this recess, I mean, uh, if you imagine that there was detail in there and there was a seam running down it, you could take this and you could run it down the seam 
to remove it like that or scrape it like that to remove it and that's otherwise an area that's difficult to work with it with a craft knife i've not used these a lot yet so i've not had them very long but i have i have put them to use on the when i did my crack last tank and yeah no, I, I like them and i can see myself using more and i've got two let me find the second one so the, this is a square two millimeter tip and this is a, again a two millimeter tip but this time it's got a round head and these actually also come with these rather smart storage boxes i was impressed by these these only cost about five or each but you get these uh, neat little storage boxes so i guess they're a bit more a bit more of a specialized tool for working on resin and I'm, I'm certainly glad i bought them and they seem good quality and i think these will last well I've kind of that goes in the cutting category, but it's a, yeah, it's slightly different. Right, so now the next category is quite a wide one because it's sanding. So with resin models, you're going to have lots of things you need to sand down to get a good finish. So for example, let's grab our example part again. You can see along here, there's a, there's been a slight mold slip mold slips these are not mold lines these are slips these should be a resin a resin part should never have a mold line you might have flash where the two molds have met but otherwise it should be perfectly aligned so there's a very small slip it's not a big one and to do that a good way to do it is to sand it down and there's another one there so not a big one quite quite easy to sort out but it's still there and if you leave these and you in you come to paint and you're doing any sort of washing and then dry brushing or highlighting you're going to leave a, a, an unpleasant looking piece of relief that is going to show in your final model. This, this is an artifact of the casting. It's not, it's not part of the sculptor's original vision. They're not supposed to be there and they will compromise the final look of your model. So sanding, there's quite a lot to this. So start, I'm going to start with the big bore stuff and work down. First thing I've got is this hemispherical file. This is a very, this used to belong to, this belonged to my father and uh, it's now mine, um, very old tool. It's got a flat, a flat side, and then a curved upper side, like so. I tend to use this flat side all the time. I don't really use the upper side, but it's there if I need it. And I use this for doing heavy duty sanding on larger pieces. Maybe if I've got a foot and I want to get something flat, uh, I might use this. But it's useful having a, a coarse grained file of some sort. Um, to do that sort of heavier duty work. The next tool I use for sanding, and I've got a whole host of these needle files. So you will commonly, if you watch my how-to videos, you will commonly see this chap, which is a, a tapered, we'll see, well, there we go. It's a tapered needle file, tapers to a point, and it's got a curved upper side. So I can show that to you and then a flat underside. This is a file, and I use all surfaces of this file a lot. And you can use the edge, you can use the upper side, you can use the lower side. And these have just got these steel handles. I mean, I, I do loads of work with these and I've never had a problem using them. Uh, they're, very, they're very precise and neat to use. You can get these things with a, with a more ergonomically shaped and attached handle or perhaps if you've got big hands you might find that easier to work with for me i find these perfectly comfortable to work with though these are probably the most inexpensive design you can get so i've got the the tapered flat and hemispherical one i've got a a flat one so this is double-sided it also has a an edge so it's about I don't know, about a millimeter thick yes yeah, so it's got an edge as well and double-sided so yep yeah. There's that one, and there's a variety of what I might, what you might call novelty shapes. This one I use a little bit from time to time, which is a, a circular file tapering to a point. Same sort of design. I do find that one useful from it time to time. I mean, sometimes if I've drilled a hole or got a hole in the detail, uh, that's a useful thing to say to bore out the hole or remove flash from the inside uh, of the hole. So that's, uh, that's that I use from time to time. These two I've kind of got, I, I very rarely use these. I don't find a lot of use for these, but I've got a, um, a triangular cross section file, needle file. And then finally, I've got a square cross section as well. Okay. 
I don't use those too much. I don't, I don't tend to find they have a great deal of application. That's files, now onto papers and the like. So I tend to do most of my coarse and, and medium sanding with those. And, but to finish, some bits of emery paper are useful. And you, these are good because you can use these wet and dry. And using them wet means you don't have to worry about dust, uh, resin dust. And this is a, what grades are these? This is, can't tell, so there's only bits here. That's a, 320, a P320 grade. That's 320 as well. That one, this one's fine. This is probably about 600. This, but they're just useful for finishing and getting a really smooth finish where you need it. Some branded filing products that I've started using recently, uh, which do the a very similar job to well, these are kind of a bit like a hybrid between a file and sandpaper. These things are called flexi flex pads made by FlexiFile. And basically, what you've got here is you've got so you've got a double-sided file. It's a sandwich, so you've got an abrasive surface, a foam layer, then a hard plastic core, another another foam layer, and then another abrasive surface. And these come in a variety of grades. So there's this 1500 grade, which is coarse, 2800 medium, 3200 fine, and then 6,000 extra fine. And then finally, I've got this uh, polishing and finishing stick, which has got kind of like, it's probably, this is like a 600, this is like the 6,000, and this is probably like the 3,200. And then you've got this polisher on the back. You could probably it, it, some, use like a cosmetic nail board for a similar sort of purpose. These are just a bit more purpose made. Yeah, so I've actually, I've been using these a fair bit since I've got them. I found them quite handy for working on resin and they they kind of probably sit somewhere between the coarse file and the needle files in, in terms of the, you know, so sort of like this is 3200, which I've been using a lot, but then this 6000 I've been finding very handy for finishing and getting a smooth finish. And then for areas that need particularly smooth, a, a, I want a particularly smooth finish on. This is handy as well. I've also been using these on the Gundam kit I'm working on as well, and that was another reason I bought them. The Gundam kit, I've been finding this particularly useful. So you need, and this polishing side, because plastic you need to be gentler with than resin in terms of uh, polishing and getting a fine finish. So yeah, so FlexiPad, so... Yeah, they're, they're actually really good. I like those. I can, um, we'll see, I'm d I don't know how durable they are yet. We'll see how they last. Um, but in terms of the actual design and the ergonomics and the effectiveness, uh, yeah, I like those. I do like those. Right, now let's talk about drills. So what do you use drills for? Well, I guess it's, it's kind of like the practical and then the cosmetic. The practical might include having to bore out circular joints. So let's... I'm getting good mileage out of this Arioc Power Claw part today. Let's just imagine, right, so you can see these recesses here, yeah, and these are for mounting part of the pistons in, uh, and they're supposed to be like that. But could you imagine, imagine if this had been cast and the mold had broken on the previous cast, and you had, and that was filled in with resin. You could, from a practical point of view, you could use a drill to bore it out. That's a, kind of like one practical use. There's cosmetic uses as well. Lots of gun barrels that you can bore out using a drill on four drill models and other models, any GW models. There's lots of guns that come with filled in barrels. You know, use a little bit of drill work and you can open those barrels out and bring out the detail in the model. Then the other main practical application of drilling, of course, is for fitting pins for strengthening models on delicate and heavily load bearing joints. So I take the, I, I, I have a number of pin vices that I use for this and I take the old fashioned approach, I do this by hand, you, know, you can get power tools as well, um, also when shooting videos it's a lot better to use hand driven tools because you don't get the noise of the drill when you're trying to talk. However before we drill there's this tool as well, now this is, I don't know what its proper name is, I call it, it's a bit like a, like a bradle, it's basically it's a steel spike. Any of our German viewers, anyone knows which company made this, I'll be fascinated to hear. It must be quite an old one, because it, quite an old tool, and it says D Germany, so I'm presuming this was made in the old Democratic Republic of Germany, so uh, East Germany at the, during the Cold War. But yeah, I don't actually know where it came from. Well, 
it was in a tool that came from my father, but I don't actually know where it originally came from. And the way this thing works is dead simple. It's a really sharp, well, not really sharp, it's a pretty sharp steel spike. This is important for drilling because when you want to start drilling, it's back again, it's useful to take this and make a guide hole to start work on. And that just, that just help that just stops your drill slipping when you start to drill and it wouldn't do on this probably wouldn't do on a surface like this but if you're drilling into a curved surface and there's a curved upper surface and it might slip so some sort of spike to do that is a useful thing and you can all, I also use this you know I can also use this for scoring out bits of resin that may, might be caught in detail so that sort of action there right pin visor so I've got three that I use routinely and these these work well for me. I've got a fine pin vise and the reason I've got three is because each pin vise has a certain choke on it that allows you to that will only hold up to a certain size of drill bit and also you I guess there's also a practical mechanical limitation with these that uh, you don't want an enormous great pin vise with a very fine drill because you allow you might well just put too much you could easily put too much force on a very fine drill and snap it. I mean, these are these thin, fine drills are quite easy to break anyway. So if you, and that's just with the amount of force you can get off a small pin vise like that. Yeah, my first one. So this is a small one. That's about half a millimeter drill. Then this is a second size. Oh, come on, focus. There you go. And this takes up to uh, this is a one mil drill in here. It's, it's probably in the region of about a millimeter, maybe, I don't know if you get like, probably, I don't know if you'll get as big as two millimeter in this, but this is kind of like a medium size one. Yeah, it's got this kind of function here, I don't use that, but you know, you can, I guess if you were sort of drilling down into something, you can hold the nubbin and drill like that. And then the third one I've got is a slightly larger choke, and that's a slightly over two millimeter drill in the, in in the fine end and then that is about that's about three millimeters this one bigger than this and then I'm going to use a power drill to do any drilling work that's the largest handheld drill I've got I don't know if there's a big one I don't know if you can get bigger handheld drills well I know you can get bigger handheld drills I don't know about pin vices but with those three I find um, I've got all the drills I need for doing normal pinning, barrel boring, etc. Now, if you need to go bigger than a power drill and regular power drill, you know, normal drills, I mean, I use, for drilling resin, you can use drills that are suitable for wood or even steel. I wouldn't use a masonry drill though, don't use a masonry drill. Wood and steel drills have always worked fine for me on resin. Sometimes you might want something even more specialized. I mean, these are, so here we've got some quite large neodymium disc magnets and these are the sort of things that you might use if you're magnetizing a titan weapon arm and yeah, these things are really really strong grip if you wanted to mount something like that into a joint then a uh, a flat wood drill or a spade drill as i sometimes refer to are useful and i've got a couple of these that i've acquired i mean i've got a few more that are useful for drilling sort of shallow wide holes um, into things. Now I'll show you an example of that. So here is the plasma blast gun from my Warhound Titan. I magnetize my arm weapons just for two, two reasons, for transport and for interchangeability. I've never actually bought any weapons because to be quite honest a plasma blast gun and a turbo laser turned out to be a pretty optimal weapon selection. But the transport utility is certainly handled. Now what you've got here is you've got a, this is a disc magnet. And originally this was curved on the top. So what I did is I, I cut it down and then I used, I think it was, yeah, it was this 13 millimeter one. I used this 13 millimeter spade drill to drill like that and, and create a, a shallow recess. I then mounted the magnet into that. So that's how you can use a spade drill uh, for fitting magnets like so. And obviously with spade drills, you've got, to you've got to make sure you've got enough depth because you've got this large countersinking head on it or guide. 
head. But yeah, so a couple of those, when you get onto the bigger stuff, might, might be useful if you do large scale magnetization. And then I guess the final thing to talk about on drilling is drill bits. Let's talk about drill bits first. To get some drill bits, you want this sort of like set of, of these called Y gauge HSS twist drills. So you know, Y gauge twist drills and this is 61 to 80 size and you get like a whole variety. These big sets are useful because I don't know about you, but I certainly break quite a few. They only last so long because with the sort of with the sort of torque that you put on these drills, they they only last so long before they fail through through metal fatigue, and you know you are going to go through those. So I've got that pack, and then I've also got a few more here, just various different sizes that I've picked up. And depending on the particular job, it's useful having a variety of these, uh, particularly when you're doing barrel boring. So you boring your barrels out. It's useful to have a mixture of drill sizes. So depending on how big the sculptor's made the barrel. You know, you've got the right drill to, to bore that out. I guess in terms of drills in general, I bought this set at my local model shop, which is a good, which I, you know, I think is a good set. There's loads of suppliers on eBay who sell these, and quite often at you, they can give you a lot of control, and you can buy very specific sizes in very in large quantities. So if you go for a particular type a lot, you can get them. And also single odd drills is a good way, get, way of getting hold of those. Sometimes rather than buying a big set of drills at something like a, like a main DIY chain, just to get hold of one drill that you're going to use, you're going to pay a lot of money to get all those extra drills. So I'd recommend the online route for those. Let's talk about wire quickly. So I use three thicknesses of wire for pinning normally. So this is about, I don't know, uh, is this about a quarter of a millimetre thick? It's pretty fine. So I use this for doing very fine pinning work. I only use this where I'm pinning something that is so fine I can't get a thicker piece of wiring because this isn't as strong as you can see. It's quite flexible. The next thickness of wire is this. Probably about half a millimetre. Again, this is sort of springy steel wire. And this is why I have those heavy duty cutters to cut this stuff. Use something like this on those, you're going to ruin your blades in no short order. So you need the right cutters for cutting springy hard wire. And then for heavy duty pins, I'll go for, i use this wire. And that's about a millimeter, really. I mean, that's really, really quite hard. That's everything on drilling. Before we move on to the miscellaneous, let's talk about adhesives. Right, so if you're working on resin models, the go-to glue really is super glue. And that's the easiest adhesive to use. It's also really well suited to the properties of resin because super glue is very good at sticking textured surfaces. Now, when we were doing a little bit of home science with the cheesel at the time, we were using, we've got a microscope and we were looking at various things as you do, sorts of bits and pieces we were looking at under the microscope. I just and then I just had an idea and I cut a very thin sliver of resin and we put it we mounted it on a slide and looked at it and it was fascinating to see how complex and textured the surface of resin is it's very it's got a lot of texture in it and it's also got there's hundreds of there's lots of tiny little air bubbles although this doesn't look like, like it's got air bubbles there are in the in the micro scale of this there are lots of tiny little air pores that have that are in there from manufacture and this just gives it a really complex surface and makes it an excellent candidate to stick with super glue you know a bit like your hands which is an unfortunate coincidence right so what super glues do i use well i use basically two types first i use is a medium thin super glue and this is what i use for doing most of my work and, and my and this particular one i mean this is zap zapper gap i use this because i like the bottle design the consistency is good as well. I mean, these guys, you know, they, they do a lot of glues. You can get everything from really thick down to super thin. So really, really thin soup glue, and which is quite tricky to use. I find for doing forge walled and other miniature modeling, it's got such a low viscosity. I actually end up spending more time sticking myself than the models. So this is, for me, this is kind of like a nice medium point. It's thin enough to run into narrow cracks, but it's not so thin that it will then run out again and end up on my fingers. I like the bottle design on this because um, you can replace the nozzles. So if I clog up or get damaged, and then it also comes with a cover. It comes with a second cover that I've, I've misplaced at the moment. So, but, you, but that just means you can keep this glue 
uh, away from air and it increases the longevity of the adhesive. Next thing you need is some thick super glue which is great for sticking big parts together. It's good for two reasons. The first reason is it it's higher viscosity gives you more time to work and sometimes on a big piece you need more time. Often it's just purely practical because you've got a lot of glue to put on. You need to be able to get that glue on before it it starts to set. That's the first thing. The second thing is the high viscosity means if you are putting large amounts of adhesive on for bigger parts, it's less likely to run and get onto you, your body or into places that you don't want, or your hands. Some form of higher viscosity superglue is useful. Also, if you're doing a terrain building as well, I find that higher viscosity superglues are useful. For this high viscosity superglue, it's I, I think it's quantity before quality. I mean, it, it's thick glue. I mean, you can get lots of brands. I use. This is one I bought as part of the Mitre kit. The reason I bought it as part of the Mitre kit is to get hold of the other companion product to go with super glue, which is an, a can of accelerant, or they call it activator here. But basically, this has got a chemical that kickstarts the setting process for super glue. If you're in a hurry to get stuff done, or you've got very sometimes quite difficult joints that take a long that might take a long time to set a little squirt of this just to kick the reaction part of the reaction off and get a bond is useful i, I think this is this is just really great I and mean, obviously it's an aerosol so don't use it if you're working in a poorly ventilated area find these together this cost about 14 quid 13 14 quid so yeah it, it, for the amount of glue you get it's it's really good value now, if you don't like aerosols or you have a poorly ventilated modelling area, you can get these things, which is exactly the same chemical principle as a can of, act of accelerant, uh, apart from now, mounted in a pen device. And you've got this sort of fibrous tip that you can use to apply the activator to the part you're working with. You're, and if you get these, make sure you always put the cap on straight away. Uh, what do I think? for these things for modeling i mean they work kind of they're not as easy to use as the kind of accelerant i find because you've got to kind of like get your part glued up then you need to before you need to quickly apply rub this onto the opposing surface recap it and then stick it quickly but it, it does work it's exactly the same principle yeah that's an alternative if you don't want the aerosol thing one thing in general with activators they will affect the fight the strength of the final bond because they're I, I think they do. I think they probably give a slightly less good final bond because they're accelerating the hardening process. And that probably affects the way that the glue sets. That's a gut feel and just based on a bit of practical experience. Perhaps if any of you guys know more, more detail about the chemistry and the practicality of these things, you might be able to elaborate that in the, on that in the comments or correct me if I'm wrong with my assumption there. Also got, I mean, the only problem with those bottles, like that one in particular, is they don't tend to stand up as well. If you're worried about your glue getting knocked over, then you can, this is a, this is again, this is really high viscosity super glue. I think this is even thicker than that. If you're not so confident with your glue, this is really, really high viscosity super glue. And I bought it because it's got this really, this nice bottle design and it's actually really quite stable. It's got a nice, nicely designed cap as well got a pin in there to keep the nozzle clear so yeah that, that's 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 quite handy I don't use it a lot as you can see there's still quite a lot left that's another example of a bottle design that you uh, if you want something that's going to stand up are we done with adhesives no we're not done with adhesives so before we get into the more exotic adhesives if you're building composite kits so Forge will do a number of plastic resin hybrid kits I'd recommend having some polystyrene cement as well for gluing the plastic parts now you can glue the plastic parts with super glue, however polystyrene cement is better. It's, it's, it gives a stronger bond on plastic because this, it depolymerizes a plastic and then when it repolymerizes you've kind of got a much stronger join as a result. A super glue is just using the principle of the surface adhesion, the, the surface grip and plastics are smoother so you don't get as good a bond on flat surfaces. So. Yeah, that's worth having. And I like this design. I mean, I've, I've built loads and loads of plastic models. I like this design because it's, it's nice and precise to use. It lasts forever. I mean, I can't even remember when I bought this now. That'll last for ages. And the thin tube also prevents it drying out. So that's a good design. I mean, you can get this in um, like little pots with brush applicators as well. I guess you can use like little fine brushes and cocktail sticks for applying that. 
but there's loads of brands of that available as well. So those are kind of adhesives for doing fairly normal sticking. However, when you're working with forge world models, some forge world models are really big and they've also got joints that have very high loading on them. So the classic example is a Titan. It will have an ankle joint, it'll have a knee joint, it'll have a hip joint, it'll have a waist joint, it'll have uh, shoulders and elbows. All those joints carry a lot of weight and if you've got parts at angles as well, the loading increases further. In those situations, I go for a, an epoxy glue and don't rely on super glue. The, I take the approach of better safe than sorry. The, la the last thing you want is when you built a Titan, you've painted it, you don't then want a joint to break because it wasn't strong enough. So, and for, for those sorts of joints, I use, I use an epoxy glue, a two-part epoxy. Two, I use two types, quick setting one. So this is five minute and the brand, this is Araldite. There's loads of different epoxies available. Again, like that, you can get them in sort of combined extruder tube. So you kind of, it's like a big syringe thing and you squirt it out and you get an equal amount of glue out of each. So that makes it easy to work with. I use, I buy this because it's cheap. I don't mind, I like the fact I can just mix a small amount of this glue because I don't often use much. So I can just mix a small amount. I'm happy enough to measure it, to equally measure out the amount I need. This sort of five minute stuff I'll use that for doing say joints on like a night titan or smaller joints on the big titans. And being five minute as well means it's pretty quick to set. With these, and I'll have to do a demo on this or find an, find an example. If you've got a p trying to position, um, these are, although it says five minutes, you're probably looking actually more like 20 minutes to get a proper join on these. And that's a long time to hold apart. One trick I've done is, uh, let's use our Arioc Power Claw again. Let's just imagine this is a really heavy load bearing joint and I wanted to use epoxy on it. One trick to get around the slow, the relatively slow setting time on this stuff is to mix it and put it in the core of the joint and then take some super glue and attach it around the edge. So you do like a super glue, almost like capsule around the core. This doesn't need air to dry. If you do that, you can then stick it, get an instant hold, but after this is cured, you've then got the strength of the epoxy as well. You can combine that with pins to taste if you want really, really strong joints. Which of the sort of joints I like to do. For the ultimate in heavy duty joints, then there's like, uh, the, these epoxy, these glues have got different strength ratings. And this is, so these are kind of like quick, and then you go all the way up to things like this, which, uh, how much does this says? So working time is 90 minutes, extra strong, heavy duty, full strength, I reckon 14 hours. I think they've changed the formulation on this. When I originally bought this, when I did my war hound, it was 24 hours full joining time. But so yeah, you can get ultra strong ones, which take, now the problem with these is they're slower to cure. So here it says they estimate the working time is 90 minutes. So that's a lot of time to hold it. So you need to be perhaps looking at some sort of clamp or something to hold the parts in place or alternatively use a capsule approach that I talked about using super glue. Uh, and that's exactly how I did the ankle, knee, and the hip joint on my Warlord Titan. As well as pinning, I glued the core using this ultra strong epoxy and then use super glue on the outer part of the joint capsule to get an instant join. So yeah. Again, it's kind of like on those difficult complex joints on these more complicated kits, it's using different glues to help, you know, to help make the attachment easier. Another example of where I've used these very strong glues is mounting this magnet into this arm. This is a very strong magnet, this. Um, I can't remember how much, what it's holding forces. I think this one's might be 500 grams at least. And there's a there's an opposing magnet, so the join on this is is really tight because I don't I I just don't want this to drop off and it won't. It's just so well the magnets are so strong. However, the strong magnets means heavy loading on the joint. So I used as you know, so you're doing this once, so you don't want it to break. Why compromise on the strength? Use the ultra strong glue, and uh, that's what I did here. So there's some ideas around adhesives. I guess the final thing on the sticky front is fillers. My go-to filler is just bog standard Milliput yellow grey. You can get lots of different colours of Milliput. This is a two-part epoxy putty. 
you can get lots of different brands of epoxy putty. If you've worked mainly with Games Workshop products, you'll probably be familiar with green stuff, and you can use green stuff for filling as well. My preference for forge wall models, surprising so models, is this because it, once it's set and cured, it files and sands in a similar way to resin whereas green stuff doesn't file very well and I, I, it's, quite, it's actually slightly rubbery when it's fully cured and I tend to find that if you sand green stuff your sanding tool, so you know, a file, gets clogged up with gunge and if you work with these things you'll ruin them. For me green stuff I use for sculpting detail if, I need, if I'm converting or if for some reason the model's damaged and I re need to recreate a detail. But there's there's lots of different brands of epoxy putters as well, although I've not used any, I mean, for me, I mean, I've used Milliput for years and years and years, and it, why have I never used anything else? Well, because it works so well, you know, if it ain't if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You can get different grades of Milliput in common ones, I mean, you get, there's like a terracotta coloured one, so if you like a different colour. There's also a, there's white Milliput, which is finer, and I think there's a silver grey one as well. I don't like the finer grade for working with because it, it really gets into your fingers and I mean I already, I'm, I'm always careful to clean my fingers off after I mix Milliput and leave it on your fingers because it's an epoxy. But the the fine, the super fine stuff is it gets into your fingers even more and I find it even harder to clean off so I just stick with the standard stuff which fine grades are more designed around porcelain work as opposed to modelling or resin work shall we say and plastic. So yeah, so that's my thoughts on fillers. Part of that is kind of like, it's your own personal preference. I mean, I say that, well, green stuff doesn't sand very well. However, if you're handy with your sculpting and you've got a couple of basic sculpting tools, then you you can probably apply it in such a way that you don't need to sand it afterwards. So, you know, horses for courses. You know, go with what you like. But that's my favorite. S adhesives and fillers. So let's finish off with some just miscellaneous items. So these are kind of like the odds and ends of a tool department that don't fit into anything else but are still an essential part of my modeling kit. So the first one is dusty brush. Yeah, I love dusty brush. I've had dusty brush for over 30 years. You can see it's well worn. It's actually, this is actually, <laughs> believe it or not, this is actually a really good quality sable brush. Um, I've never used it to paint with, I've just always used it for dusting. Hopefully it'll last me another 30. And that's just useful for, well, dusting away resin turnings and stuff as you're, um, you're working away. The next thing is a wooden cocktail stick, a large wooden cocktail stick. So this is like a super size. You can get this dead cheap, a couple of pounds in the UK, mm. major supermarkets and probably lots of other places as well. I mean, in barbecuing season, I'll have loads of these in. It's useful sometimes just having a point. I mean, there's another one here. You can get glue on, you can, I mean, you see that's got some glue on it, you can just cut them off and sharpen them afterwards. You know, you can cut it to shape if you need it for a specific purpose. And also they're very useful for pushing in magnets into parts when you're mounting them, because of course with them being wood, they're not ferromagnetic. And trying to use things like say the bradle spike with neodymium magnets, trying to push them in just means you end up with the magnet stuck to the spike as opposed to in the part. So they're very handy. Talking of magnets, a sharp marker of some colour or equivalent permanent marker. I just like sharp. I use it. I've got a sharpie because Mrs. Lee Cheese gets through loads of these things all, with all of her kids' clubs and stuff she does. Is that for marking polarities on the magnets? Handy for that. Final tool is a pair of tweezers. So these are, who did this? I've still got this. I'm not using these a lot. These are Tamiya. Just a pair of fine modeling tweezers. You can get much cheaper, simpler tweezers than these. I consider these to have been a little bit of an extravagant purchase. However, you know, I mean, they are handy. And when I've been working on my Gundam kits, I found them useful for that. So from time to time, it's kind of like one of those things. They, spent most, they spend most of the time in the pack. However, from time to time, I'm really pleased I've got them. So a pair of tweezers of some sort might also be of use. Well, there you have it. There is my tool collection for working on resin models. So yeah, there's quite a lot of stuff there now. Yeah, I hope you found that an interesting little discussion and walkthrough as to you know what tools I use, why I've got them, and the purpose of having particular tools. Um, yeah, I hope you found that interesting. 
If you've got any questions about any of these tools or perhaps any suggestions about tools you use that you find really handy, leave them in the comment section. I'll be very interested to hear. I hope you found that useful. I hope you find it helpful as well. Thank you very much for watching. I'll speak to you next time and goodbye.